All right, Science 30s, welcome. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the notes on describing sustainability. Uh, there's not too much uh, um, terminology, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. There's just some really neat examples I'd like to reinforce, and hopefully it helps you with the vocabulary. So uh, first off, sustainable. Um, this is a hot button word anytime you're talking about uh, developing energy systems or you know, doing any kind of a project, um, we want to be able to, uh, you know, maintain uh, either energy or some other system without interruption, weakening, or loss of essential characteristics. So basically, if something is sustainable, then it can maintain itself indefinitely. Uh, the reverse, of course, is non-sustainable. So it's incapable of being able to be maintained without some kind of interruption. And so uh, things that are non-sustainable, obviously, are uh, we've talked about our dependence on fossil fuels. Ultimately, the, the sources will run out. So that kind of, um, that's closely tied with renewable and non-renewable. So that leads into the idea of sustainable development. We want to make sure that we're developing industry and natural resources in ways that meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. So we are not, uh, if an un unsustainable development is, <clears throat> would be, you know, taking all the resources uh, right now and using them in a short period of time and leaving nothing for, you know, your, your kids and your grandkids type thing, okay? There's three types of sustainability and I just wanna kind of go through them and give you a, a number of examples of what they mean. Um, the, the first one is ecological sustainability. So anything that sustains the ecosystems, okay, or the ecology. So we're talking about air, water, and uh, air, land, and water, okay, um, as well as the biodiversity of organisms. So all of these here, we don't want to be, we want to be able to maintain um, those and not disrupt them. So. Uh, all of these are examples, and uh, I won't read every single one of them, but, you know, if you're maintaining, uh, you know, if the project, do you maintain the amount of water, you know, before and after use, and do you maintain the quality of water uh, if you're, um, you know, looking to extract energy in a certain way? Make sure we're not producing acid rain or acid pollution. Um, we're not contributing to organic pollutants or heavy metals. Are we recycling uh, waste products as best we can? Are we avoiding any contributions to deforestation? Um, we're not making smog. We're not threatening uh, certain species of wildlife. And uh, we're also not releasing any radioactive or ionizing radiation. Okay. So all that has to do with the ecosystem. So that's sort of this first branch of sustainability is, is the ecological side. And uh, uh, just as a fun example, uh, you might recognize this picture. This is Cardston, and this is these are the two holding ponds, or I don't know if, if they call them reservoirs, uh, that our drinking water comes from for our town. So if you're looking here, this is the uh, right here is the Agrodome, and uh, if you just come south a bit from the Agrodome, you come up a hill, and um, there's there, there's two big holding tanks, tanks, actual concrete tanks. I think they hold like a million gallons or something. And then we got these huge um, ponds or uh, holding reservoirs here. So um, years ago, uh, Bart Atwood, he's the he's the director of I think it's infrastructure services or whatever for the town of Cartston. He kind of oversees a bunch of the water uh, treatment facilities, and. Uh, there were a number of years ago, the water, actually there was an algae bloom that happened in either one or both of these uh, holding reservoirs. And um, the water gets processed, all of this water here, it gets processed in this, this building right here. And then there's pipes that carry it to the town. And so uh, they were still able to process the water even though this algae bloom was there, but uh, the water had a funny smell and people in the town picked up on it. It was a little bit sort of annoying. Some people, it, some people didn't really care, but others, it was sort of an irritant to bother. And uh, <clears throat> they had the option of the town had an option of using a whole bunch of chemicals to dump those into these ponds here. And 
um, kind of clear up the algae. And it would cost, it would have cost a fair bit of money and you would have been adding chemicals to the water, which would then need to be either um, taken out in the treatment center. So it would have kind of, uh, there, 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 it was a solution, but, uh, um, uh, Bart Atwood apparently had the idea, well, what if we just stock these ponds with fish? This pond, actually, this bigger one already had pike in it, I think, um, that had gone gotten through the filters. I believe it was this second one, though, over here, this one here. That one uh, was a second holding pond, and it didn't have any fish in it. So they, they, they um, did, deposited, like, thousands of fish small fish, I think trout, and um, it took some time, but eventually the water cleared up and uh, the introduction of a species of fish to this, to this pond um, stabilized the ecosystem and kept the algae bloom from getting out of control. And um, as a result, the water is clean. So that's a good example of an, of an ecologically sustainable solution because it didn't introduce any uh, any any extra chemicals it definitely didn't cost any i mean it did cost some money to buy the fish but it was not a um it was a much in, a much cheaper solution and as a result we've got awesome water and we really do have great water here in karsten it's i think it's really pristine anyway the second one the ty second type of sustainability is societal sustainability and um this is the ability of basically a group to support the living standards for its members so you know um, is, you know, you kind of weigh this in the balance. Is this project sustainable from a societal point of view? Do we, are we ensuring that we still have adequate housing, that our healthcare is good and that we respect and maintain cultural values? So these, these green questions, um, or these green points kind of illustrate this in this first part. Okay. It doesn't reduce a life expectancy. It stimulates a healthy economy. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, they're all kind of listed there. Reduces excessive land, so we're trying to we're trying to curtail the amount of land that's being developed too too rapidly or not correctly. Um, encourages per capita energy consumption to be reduced. Okay, anything we can do to encourage um, uh, our citizens to not use as much energy, that's going to benefit everyone else. Um, definitely stimulating healthy economy. That's kind of um, actually yeah, which enables affordable housing and uh, cooperation of diverse cultural groups. So um, societal sustainability is really closely tied to economic sustainability, okay? Uh, economic, of course, is uh, more the business side, uh, being make sure we have access to goods and services, but in a way that does not decrease the availability of natural resources. So um, you can see here an energy technology that demonstrates economic sustainability uh, it supports full-time employment, uh, has a relatively low cost per megajoule, yeah, reduces the import of energy and enables the export of energy, okay? So, um, yeah, it does not decrease the availability of natural resources. So why I'm, and then you might see these pictures here and I'm gonna show you some other ones. Our town has actually been, some, the town of Karsten has been among some of the leading towns in our province in um, solar, energy in getting electrical energy from the sun. Um, the key terms here, this this is our uh, ice rink, uh, the, the Cheeseman Center downtown. And this is the uh, the town of, or sorry, like the the actual town office, the, the town office building. And uh, a number of years ago, they installed these solar panels on the buildings to produce what's called a net zero building. What that means is the building generates enough electricity to meet its own needs so that it's it's a basically um, we're not paying money for electricity there's no electrical bill for these buildings okay um, Cardston has done this for a number of years and that definitely encourages uh, reduces the import of energy it's reducing our need for electrical energy because we're generating it ourselves and in fact um, there's the potential to generate more electricity than we would use for those buildings, meaning that you can sell that energy back to the grid, as they say, or that we could, that would fall under this category of exporting energy, okay? Contributing positively, okay? So um, 
what's really fascinating about this, and actually here, let me just pull this up so you can see this. Um, this is the town of Cardston website. Um, it last year, the town of Cardston started developing or building a solar farm. And it's over 4,000, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Uh, I think it was over, uh, yeah, 4,000 solar panels. Um, here, I think it maybe talks about it just down here. Sorry to jump around. There it is right here. Oh yeah, 4,752. <laughs> okay. Um, so all of these solar panels are located right here if you see this map. So um, this is Highway 5 or the Waterton Highway. Uh, this turnoff right here, if you can see my cursor, this heads towards the cemetery. So if, if you're driving out to the Cardston Cemetery, you can't miss it. It's on your left-hand side. You'll see a whole, like you'll see row upon row upon row of solar panels. Uh, like it says there, it's about eight and a half acres. And they've just completely covered it with these um, uh, solar panels. Now, um, the town in this pamphlet here, it already highlights the two buildings I've mentioned. And... Um, the those are net zero buildings already but basically the town wants to generate enough electricity to power all of the town buildings so all of our pump houses all of the buildings that the town owns that have power um and that, that that's, there's quite a list of those but anyway this is the big one here the key aspect of this project is the town will be saving money every year on electricity bills now after about 15 years right because they've they had to pay, pay a lot of money up front, so they got to pay that off. But after 15 years, the, the solar farm will generate enough electricity to save the town over a quarter of a million dollars. So it's over 250000 almost $260,000 every year. That's amazing. That's just, I'm super excited about that. I think, uh, you know, I think as a taxpayer, um, taxpayers are going to be really happy that the town made that kind of an investment. And um, anyway, there's more detail here if you're really curious. Here's a list of the infrastructure, the facilities um, that require electricity and the solar panels that are being set up by our town will cover the, the electrical needs for all of these places, okay? So we have our treatment centers, swimming pool, um, all the street lights in town, um, all of the, uh, the, fo like the football field, um, any of the lighting for that, the golf course, reunion complex, you name it. Um, anyway, so there's quite an extensive list here, but all of these facilities will not uh, need basically electricity. Really what will happen is that the, that electricity is sold back into the grid, but we're able to use it directly. So uh, very impressive. I just think uh, we're on the right, we're headed in the right direction here with um, uh, sustainability right in here in our town. And I, in my opinion, I don't think we're too far away from uh, uh, having homeowners with, or giving, uh, with, sorry, we're not too far away from homeowners having the capability of installing solar panels on their roof and charging their own batteries and generating their own electricity. I'm really optimistic that's going to happen in the next 10 or 15 years, maybe sooner. Anyway, so the last part of this section is you need to know two other kinds of energy, both of which are not extensively used right here in Alberta, um, but they are alternatives and their possible uses. The first one is geothermal, so it's just heat that's generated from the Earth's core. What's worth noting is the Earth's core is already hot, um, but its its temperature is partially maintained by uh, radioactive decay. So unstable isotopes, and here's a list of them, potassium-40, thorium-232, and uranium-235 and 238. These guys in the core of the Earth actually undergo radioactive decay. So they produce alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, and in the process release their heat. And that actually helps maintain the temperature of the core. Uh, as you saw there, it's around 5,000 degrees Celsius. That's insanely hot. But uh, most of you know that the, you know, the Earth is uh, liquid, has a liquid core, or well, there's a, there's a liquid around the core, um, molten magma or molten iron, basically. And um, that, uh, that heat, as it, it, if it's accessible to the surface can be harnessed or the energy of that heat can be harnessed. So um, geysers, but the main one here is this geothermal generation where we can pump you know, fluid down deep into the earth, let it be heated and warmed by this heat that's in the, near the, uh, you know, through the earth's crust and then pump that back to the surface and use it. So we're gonna look at some of that. Now, um, it's, I mean, it's got some advantages and you'll see that as we go through this. Um, for sure, the, the amount of heat there is going to be there for millions of years. So this isn't like this is a resource that's going to be depleted. 
And generating electricity using geothermal energy is actually very, it's relatively inexpensive and it's pretty efficient. So the main disadvantage though, is that it's not always ideal. The geological uh, you know, conditions that need to be right to use geothermal um, energy are fairly specific. Um, yeah, there, I mentioned there is some uh, hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide gas, but there's not as much as from fossil fuels, not by a long shot from what I know. So, um, but that can be a problem. But uh, yeah, if you're not near like a fault line or if you're not near where there's um, natural, you know, volcanic activity or anything like that, there's a good chance that it's not a, rel a, re a really feasible form of energy use. Um, another one that's completely irrelevant to Alberta <laughs> is tidal energy, but uh, let's face it, the majority of the Earth's population lives near the ocean, uh, lives near the coast, coastal regions. And um, the tide, uh, the gravitational pull of the moon, if we remember we talked about gravity, the moon actually pulls on, it actually generates tides twice a day as the moon orbits the Earth, okay? But as it does, the moon pulls first on the mass of water that is nearest to it. And that you can see here, this arrow is the biggest of the three because we're closest to the moon. So the moon really pulls on the water in the ocean. Now it does also pull on the earth, but that's uh, the center of the earth is a little bit farther away than, you know, than the surface water nearest or the surface ocean water nearest the moon. So it doesn't pull on that as much, but what's, it's kind of a weird way to think of it, but it's like we're yanking the earth away from its water and it's kind of like pulling a tablecloth out from underneath all of the, you know, the silverware and plates on a table. So when you do that, you kind of leave the, you know, the, the, the silverware and plates on the table. That's what's happening back here. The earth is kind of being yanked away from the water. And so the water also bulges out on the opposite side of the earth opposite of where the moon is located. Okay. So when the moon is up here, um, then you get, you know, you'll get, you'll get a big pull here, not as big of a pull here. And then, um, you know, you'll have water that will kind of slosh away and it has a little bit less there too. So anyway, I'll kind of erase that because it's getting a bit messy. But so the point is um, that as that water comes in and out twice a day, um, that's potentially harvested. And some of these have already been built. Uh, there's not, there's sometimes it's not ideal in terms of harnessing it, but uh, you know, if you have, um, if you have like an inlet here along, and I'm just making this up here, if we're along the, along the coast and you have an inlet like this, um, the tides are going to come in and then they're going to go out twice a day. So what you can do is build what's called a barrage. And um, it's basically just a dam that has holes in it or that has kind of junctions in it. So the dam forces all the water to go through the openings like this. And in these, in these openings, we place what's called the, or these tidal stations here. So as you know, in this case, as the water comes in, as the tide rises, the water's funneled through and it hits a turbine and it, that it just pushes the turbine. It's like uh, wind energy, but with water. So by pushing that turbine, it's connected to a generator and that can generate electricity, but that'll happen as the tide comes in and then, and then it's stable, you know, for a couple hours or whatever. And then the tide goes back out and then you can harness it again. So basically twice a day, um, we can harness the energy, moving energy of water. And yes, it, it, it can generate um, some significant amounts of electrical energy, which is why it's kind of piloted and tested in a number of places. But as you can see here, one of the disadvantages is, well, yeah, you can damage our little ecosystem here. You know, if we have, you know, uh, wildlife, sea, sea life, marine life that's coming in and out, we might compromise its ability to thrive. Um, but the, probably the biggest one, though, is it's just it only happens twice a day. So it's not like we're going to it's not like we can continuously generate electricity on demand. Um, it's more of a supplemental form of energy as a lot of these are, as you'll see. So anyway, so that's this first section. If that helps you understand some of that terminology a little bit, maybe give you a few examples. Um, I will post another video on the second section. So anyway, keep up the good work.